you'll open your Bibles this morning to the book of Colossians. Please turn there to the book of Colossians in chapter number one. And we'll not, uh, uh, we'll not read the entire thing, but we do want to read a, a few scriptures. And we're going to still, on this uh, day after Christmas, speak of uh, God in the flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some number of years ago, while you're turning there, Colossians chapter 1, give you a few moments to find that uh, passage. Um, many years ago, uh, among brethren that I was around, from time to time, there would be a question uh, asked of what, uh, would we see God, or would we see the Holy Spirit, or would we see Christ? And I believe... Uh, that in this message and in this passage of scripture uh, today uh, that we will uh, see where that uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is literally God in the flesh. We know that from past messages and scripture, but I think this today will uh, clear that out. And there's always a question among the brethren, but I've often ever since then and so, oh, see, through the years in the study of God's word and just not really the great study of it, but just simply the um, a reading of a passage or two here and there uh, that when uh, Jesus Christ was born as a baby in Bethlehem's manger some many years ago, now over 2,000 years ago, that was literally God in the flesh. And I, I'm uh, amazed at the thought that sometimes, and I've mentioned it from this pulpit, that uh, when baby Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit to Mary and the earthly father, which had nothing to do with his birth, was Joseph, uh, that was God literally in the flesh. I really believe that because the Bible will teach it to us this morning. But look in, uh, uh, in verse chapter 1 of that little book, and I'm going to read it uh, ha just here and there. If you look in verse 5, it's a passage of Scripture that I want to share with you here in a few minutes. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Certainly that bears out our th first thought in a few minutes about heaven is our hope. And it's not, it's not like a hope that we kind of hope for something that we might want and there's a possibility that we'll get it and there's a possibility that we won't get it. But this hope is a surety for those that know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. If you look in verse number 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, uh, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And if you pay special attention in 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now in verse 15, bears out what I've already said for a few moments ago, who is the image, and this person that he's speaking about in verse 14 is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, uh, the firstborn of every creature. I know there's a passage in the Old Testament where it says no man has ever seen God, but when Christ was born, he is God in the flesh, and they actually did. I believe, see God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary held him in her bosom. Others helped during those days, and the 12 apostles that walked with him in the three years that, of his public ministry had fellowship with God in the flesh, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image. Now, this is a very important verse who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And I'm going to get to it in the last moments of our message. If you slip over to chapter 2, there in that uh, book of Colossians, and verse number 9, let's connect it up. We'll connect it up a little bit later on a little bit. 
for in him, and this is speaking of in Christ, for in him dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. <coughs> for in him, speaking of Christ, dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bodily. So I don't think that it leaves us uh, wondering or trying to find out another uh, thought about that, but I think it's pretty plain that as they saw Jesus Christ in the days of his public life, those 33 years that he lived here on the earth, or thereabout, 33, maybe 33 and a half, that they were, trans they were looking at God in the flesh. And so let me read in verse 15 again, who is the image of the invisible God? the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that's in heaven, that's, our, that, that's in the earth, visible, the invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Speaking, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is before all things and by him all things Consist, and he is before all things, and he is the head of the body, the church. You know, the head of the church that we know of it, uh, and there is no invisible church, there's just one church. There is the body of Christ that uh, uh, we are all that were saved, but the church is local in the New Testament. I believe it teaches that the churches that they had and the churches that we have today are local churches like us, scattered here and yon all over the world, even in uh, terrible countries today where very little gospel is preached. And he is before all things, in verse 17, and by him all things <laughs> consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn, from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminent. For it pleased the Father that in him, now look at this verse, isn't this a great verse? For it pleased the Father, and that's speaking of God in heaven, that in him should all of the fullness of the Godhead, I believe, dwell. And I'm going to read another verse or two. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him <coughs> to reconcile things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in heaven or things in the earth. God in the flesh. We've already alluded to this, and message is already uh, looking to cr uh, Christmas time this year and many years, but all of this really in chapter 1 of the book of Colossians and talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, it really speaks of John chapter 3, and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And he gave his son in, in birth in, in Bethlehem's manger. And that baby grew to about 30 years old, had a public ministry, and then went to the cross and died there for, and gave his life bud for that you might not go to hell, but that you and I might go to heaven by simply taking him and believing in him as Lord and Savior. And so uh, this morning, really the thought of our message is redemption. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. From the beginning of the Bible, uh, from the times of Genesis chapter 1 and on through, there was something every time that God was pleased with a sacrifice from man, it rep it, there was some kind of representation of blood. You know, uh, we, I, I, I say that it's not a funny thing, but God was only pleased in all of the Old Testament and in the first part of the New Testament, he was only pleased with the shedding of blood. Way back when uh, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were new on the earth. God had created uh, Adam out of the dust of the earth. Did you? I read something the other day that one fellow said, uh, why, I can make man just like God did. And God said, okay, just try it. And so he reached down 
to a dirt pile. And God said, oh, oh, just a minute. Get your own dirt. And so man can't do what God did. Amen? amen. I said, amen? amen? You're a dull crowd. Smile. <laughs> Say amen again. Amen. And so you see, it's all about redemption. From the very first, God was satisfied with the slaying of a lamb when Abel gave the right gift to God, and it was blood. He did not take the fruit of the land from Cain because nothing of the, that represent works. And the shed blood represented something that man didn't have anything to do with. And many thousands of years later, the perfect Lamb of God without sin wasn't one iota speck of sin in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ when he gave his soul and his life for you and me. Redemption. It's all about John 3.16. I, I wrote down a, a, a thought here. You know the song that they sing a lot? Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? I put that I put that to my thoughts in the last week and you have to read. Mary did you know when when she uh, took care of the baby uh, Jesus all of those years of his babyhood then his youth and his growing up and and there in their home did you know that uh, she was having the closest uh, uh, communion with God uh, that a person could have she raised him I wonder, I wonder what Mary thought those many years. She knew that God had spoken to her early on as a young lady. Many people believe that she might have been as young as 14 or 15 years of age. In those days, they did marry and, and take up life like that at a very early age. And just think, in the raising up of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if she did not ponder in her heart. The word, the New Testament uses the word ponder, to think and to wonder, to what, what's this all about? And yet she had heard the voice of God, uh, where that she would be impregnated by the divine Holy Spirit of God, and, uh, and that she would, uh, and that she would, uh, uh, raise this young boy. You remember the occasion whenever they had been down to pay taxes and they're just all the way back to home. They were missing him and they didn't miss him for a day and then they went back uh, to uh, the city and they found him, uh, you know, telling the doctors of law and so on uh, what, what it's all about. Did, and he said, did you not know that I would be about my father's business? And I wonder what Mary thought then. I think her perhaps her mind went back to the time when God spoke to her and said, you will bear a child and you'll be, you'll be impregnated by the Holy Spirit of God. You see, man didn't have one thing to do with the birth of Christ except he chose Mary. Now there are those today after all of these years that give great credits to Mary. I believe she was a blessed woman and remained a blessed woman the rest of her day. She bore other children. Uh, her and Joseph did. But I believe that God honored her. But she is not to be honored ever over her son Jesus and God Almighty. Amen? Amen. And we bless her holy name this morning. And in, I bring your attention again to verse 5. That for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven... Oh, beloved, our hope, our, we don't hope for it like we hope for a new car or a million dollars, but we have that hope that we will be in heaven with God because of the fact of the birth of Christ, his, his death, his resurrection, and that just by taking him as our Savior, we have no other Savior. The world doesn't save us. You know, I think of the time I have met people and I, 
I mentioned this years ago about the very, one of the most richest men in America today, an older man. He's in his <coughs> late 80s worth billions of dollars, I think around 60 billion at this time. And he made a statement something like this, you mean to tell me that with all my money that I can't go to heaven? Similar to that, beloved, listen, if, if I or you or somebody else it could say we own the whole earth and everything in it. We, without Christ, we would die and go to hell. Nothing secures our eternal life in heaven with God but the Son of Jesus Christ who died, was born and died and was resurrected. Verse number 15. And look at it again, will you? And this is the great portion of our message this morning. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? The very image of God. Men have seen God in the flesh. He lived here approximately 33 maybe 33 and a half years on the earth before he was crucified, put in the grave, and ascended into heaven. He lived here about those many years. So men have seen God. You remember the story that we've mentioned many times. The little boy was, was drawing on his, um, on his tablet, and uh, somebody asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, the lady said, you, nobody knows what God looks like. Well, he said, they will when I get through. <laughs> and uh, I've got a picture. I, I thought I had it in my hallway, uh, a, little, a little round thing like that, uh, uh, a picture that says somebody drew it and painted it many, many years ago, and it's been used <laughs> on many uh, uh, picture frames, uh, uh, pictures through the years, small and large, and it's a handsome picture, but history probably tells us, if we really want to look into it, that he wasn't necessarily a handsome man. And when we look upon him, we will look upon God in the flesh, the very image of God. Who will we see? I believe we'll see Christ in the flesh. Slip over one more time, and it's not the last thing, to chapter 2 and verse 9. And I want to indwell, kind of put this deep in your thought. For in him, for in him Christ dwelleth all of the fullness, fullness of the Godhead bodily. What is the Godhead? I believe we can, as I've said many times, God the Father, and God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank for God the Holy Spirit. He's the one that deals with us. He's the one that brings conviction upon your heart. As a Christian, if you're convicted of sin, it's the Holy Spirit <coughs> that convicts you. It, it, it might be a portion of, uh, of your uh, inner being, that you know that you're a Christian and you uh, do things right and you do things wrong. I do things right, I do things wrong. But basically, it's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction in our heart when we sin against God, when we sin against somebody else, when we do something wrong. And not only when we do something wrong, but that when we fail to do something right. You know, it's just, a, it's just as much sin to not, to not to do something right for us Christians as it is for us to do something wrong. A lot of times I think we as God's people think we only sin when we say something bad, when we treat somebody bad, when we say a bad word. But beloved, we're in sin when we fail to do that which is right. What is one of the greatest things to, for us to do right? Is to respect his word, 
to read it, study it, and make it a part of our lives. How many of you, and you don't raise your hand, but let it be in your mind. How many of us, and I include myself, make this a, a mighty part of our lives? The more that we make this a part of our lives, the better Christian that we are to be. When I think of that kind of a thought, and may I pass it along just in passing, how many times I went in that little house where Mama died, uh, well, in, 19, in March the 2nd of 1995, my mother passed away. I'm, I'm outside of one person. I'm the oldest living uh, bishop uh, 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 man, or person in the bishop clan. I had one aunt to outlive me, and I'm determined to outlive her, so you better get ready. But anyway, uh, we find that we, uh, I go in there all, every morning, mid-morning, and she'd be in that middle room reading and studying her Bible, even at an old, old age. My mother, I'm a I'm your preacher this morning. I'm your pastor. I'm a Christian. Humanly speaking, only because my mother loved God and she loved us boys and led us in the admonition of the Lord. The very image of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to close with a few things about how great he is. And it tells us from verse 16... Uh, and following, and you look at it again, please. For by him were all things created. God, Jesus. Now we're talking. We're not talking about God here. We're talking about Christ. Amen. We need to exalt him. We we of course believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But our passage of scripture, uh, scripture in these days in which we commemorate the birth of Christ. For by him were all things created. That's in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones, dominions. All things were created by him and for him. As I read that afresh this morning, they were created for God. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. <coughs> Man is not a head of the church. I would hope to think and, and believe and rest in the promise that Christ is our leader in our church. I'm talking about individual local New Testament churches just like Acre and Baptist Church. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things that he might have preeminence. Paul, when he wrote this, church, this book to the church at Colossae, he said Christ is to have preeminence. And let me, let me add something to my thought for me and for you. Christ is to have the preeminence in our life. And myself standing before you as a called preacher some many years ago, oh, he is to be the preeminence in my life. He is to be first. And how, how hard it is sometimes to make him preeminent in my life. For it pleased the Father that in all things should all the fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. I say whether they be things in heaven or in earth. And you that were sometimes alienated alienated and enemies of your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled even though we were away from God he reconciled us to God we can never come this passage of scripture teaches us there's one way to God and that's through Jesus Christ you'd be surprised that those that they will say they believe in God I, I, have, I have talked to very few people in all of these years that are true atheists or agnostics. Very few. I don't know. I, I, I can't reconcile back for 70 years, but 
I, I don't think that I've met over at the most 15 or 20 and probably less of people talking to people, knocking on doors that literally said, I do not believe in God. But I have dealt with the countless numbers of them that have not received Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And in his body of his flesh, in verse 22, through death presents you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. How great, how great is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I repeat verse 19 in closing. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness of the Godhead dwell. He is preeminent. And oh, would I plead with myself and plead with you to make him preeminent in your life. How do we do that? By prayer, by paying attention to the Bible, to for loving his church. And I'm not after those that are not here this morning, but beloved, my connection, of course, with God is Firstly, in my personal belief, my connection with God is by looking at His Word. My connection with God, first off, is the best thing that I do. And I told you many times, pray every morning as I walk uh, that couple of three, couple of miles or better. I mention every one of your names and your children's names to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a special need, I go to God about it in a more concerted way. But your name, oh, it's, I think it's very important that your name and others' names is mentioned to God. Paul used the word mention many times in the New Testament. He just said, bless Roger Bishop. He didn't go into detail. For it pleased God that in all that the preeminence might be in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we are the day after we commemorate Christmas. And may we, may we end this year out, this coming week, by blessing him. I'm still marveled at Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Just think. The psalmist said that Roger Bishop could bless the Lord. Let's stand with that bow.